Hey there, fellow counselors, psychologists, and those that um, are interested in the field of psychology. I want to thank you for joining me. Um, I'm going to have to redo lectures seven and eight. I've had um, a lot of my videos just disappear. I can't find them. Um, I went to redo my, you know, to get my notes so I could redo them and and my notes went from uh, being a 60, 70 pages to one page. I, I don't know how, but somehow all my stuff got deleted online and on my computer. Uh, at least I can't find my notes. I found my notes. They just don't cover the last topic. So anyway, I'm going to redo lecture seven and eight, and I, I don't know what happened. I'm hoping this one stays on. I do know that uh, I'm not supposed to offend people through YouTube anymore. So I have to watch what I say because they had given me my last warning um, because a lot of my videos have been found uh, offensive to uh, Hindus, Muslims, LGBTQ, warlocks, especially the warlocks and, and the witches. They really – anyway, so I want to talk about schizophrenia. And um, schizophrenia is a, is a topic – people think they know what schizophrenia is, but – a lot of them really don't. And unless you have been living with it or with somebody that has schizophrenia, you, you really won't understand um, what they're going through. Schizophrenia is, is one of the saddest, um, it's one of the saddest debilitating mental health issues out there. I remember when I worked at the Department of Social Security, um, we had a guy that was there because uh, they hire so many that are disabled. And um, he had schizophrenia, so they had a person that was assigned to help him with his daily his daily work. And basically, he would uh, do his work. He had his own cubicle that was set off from everybody else so that people didn't um, bother him or trigger him would be a better word. They had to keep the lights low over there. It was very dark if you were had to go talk to him. Uh, several times we had, uh, were working on a, a case that was very similar, and I had to go and collaborate with him. Schizophrenia, some people can live with it. Some people can manage it. I've worked with a handful of people with schizophrenia in the past. I've known quite a few people with schizophrenia when I was in the prison system. And they, they have, I call it, I believe there are eight types of schizophrenia, but the Mental Health and Diagnostic Statistic Manual recognizes five. So let's start with the key symptoms. Um, schizophrenia, by the way, you can't be diagnosed with schizophrenia unless you've been observed for two years. The way that they diagnose, there are several ailments or mental conditions that can only be diagnosed if the person has been observed having them for a lengthy period of time. I mean, for instance, bipolar disorder. Uh, you have to have that for an average of two years before it's considered to be a, a type 1, a type 2. If it's a type uh, 3 or it's less than a year, um, then it's considered to be something to deal more with the hypothalamus, et cetera, et cetera. And so it's bipolar 3. So there are certain things that have to have a longevity, longevity or what we call a continual persistence to where they are neither abated or uh, negated, but they continue. And so the number one problems or number one things that you're going to see um, with schizophrenia is the person is going to have delusions. Um, now, the delusions can take one of several different, it can be delivered one of several different ways. I mean, for instance, you can talk to somebody and part of the delusion is, is they don't hear what you say, but rather they hear something different. Their mind steps in and tells them something different than what you've said. Uh, I'm doing this without notes, folks. I, I put a lot of hours in on them notes. Um, anyway, so I'm doing this from memory. So one of the things is, is they'll have delusions. Uh, schizoid delusions, schizoid tendencies. And the delusions can be thoughts of grandeur, thoughts that there's something that they're not, can be voices that they hear. It can be delusions in what we'd call performance issues. 
Um, and basically, the, the reason that they're having delusions, I'll get into that in a moment, it, is significant. And it's going to be one of the reasons why they they have these delusional symptoms. The second is hallucinations. Um, hallucinations is different than delusions. Okay. Uh, delusions is, is when you can be hearing the wrong thing. You have the wrong idea. You, you're, you don't understand. You're not able to understand what it is that's coming in and what you're processing. Hallucinations is when you're literally seeing things like a, a person standing next to me or people in front of me or an animal like the son of Sam. Um, I talked to relatives of the son of Sam. I actually counseled one of them. And, um, they told me a lot about him, and, and he would actually physically see a, a, a Rottweiler that would show up and it would talk to him. Um, but he was also, most people don't know, the son of Sam Murder was a hardcore Satanist. He had been born in a family that worshipped Satan. They were very much into the occult practice. And he had been told that if he committed a certain amount of murders, that he would be given rule in hell over 10,000 souls, that he wouldn't suffer in hell. But he would get to rule and use 10,000 different souls however he chose. Folks, the devil will lie to you. Um, but that's a hallucination. When you see something that nobody else sees, but yet you see it and you can hear it and you can speak to it. When I worked in the prison system, I was a chaplain uh, at DHS of Joliet Penitentiary. I was also the head chaplain over LaSalle County and for a short time, um, until they closed the facility down at the shared correctional facility in Illinois. And um, I moved, and but I was in those three facilities, but I would train and I would go and speak at training seminars for chaplains so they would be equipped. I used to train them and put them in positions throughout Illinois and western Indiana. But when I would work with somebody that was schizophrenic, the first I would always meet with them with thick glass. Um, because that's the way Illinois did it. Now, when I went to Missouri, it was different. But thick glass, and they would bring them in, usually chained um, hands to waist to feet, because I worked with some very violent offenders. At DHS, I worked with individuals that had already served their time, but they could not be released back into society because they were so violent. And I had... Um, 22 of them that I worked with regularly there, and every one of them were schizophrenic. And I think it was demonic schizophrenia. I'll get into that in just a moment. But when the person would sit down, if they would be going like this, or staring deeply at me like, you know, like they want to attack me and stuff, because sometimes they don't see a human there, they see a demon. I've had people tell me, I don't, you know, do you know what you look like? And I would say, well, tell me. You look like just gold light radiating. What's wrong with you? You know, or I see a halo over your head. And You know, sometimes they can see something horrendous, but they'll see different things. And that's a hallucination. Okay? Hallucinations can also take the form of thoughts where a person has literally thought they've been doing something or been with someone, but they haven't. And this is where we get closer towards the catanesis type of schizophrenia. I'm going to get into the types in just a second. So in other words, they may think that you came over and spent the day with them, but you might not have seen them for weeks. And it's because the brain will make up this scenario. And it's called subjugated or, or conflagrated memory. Uh, it's the imposition of subjugated or conflagrated memories, which means the brain creates its own memory to one, keep you from being uh, hurt or to protect you. Two, it's to keep you from getting any worse. The brain will begin creating scenarios to fill in gaps so that you're not alone, so that you're with people. Um, so hallucinations can take many different forms. And you, when you're working with somebody or if you're related or if you have a family member, um, you have to you have to take that into effect. In other words, when you're with them, you have to understand and you have to pause, make eye contact, and talk slowly. Take gaps. Allow 
their brain to perceive and understand what you're doing. It's like working with somebody on methamphetamines. You don't move like this. If you have to move to open the door, you do it like this, very slowly, because their brain is at such a heightened speed processing many different things, not just you there, but it'll be on a half a dozen other things sometimes. Sometimes they're listening, they're hearing what we call white noise or false noise. It's I've heard everything from super hard satanic music. I had a boy brought to me that was tearing the sides of the, the hair out of his head and he was on medication and he just couldn't take it. And he was diagnosed as being schizophrenia and medications weren't working and he was going to kill himself. And uh, he was 14. His mother brought him to me and he had demonic schizophrenia. How do I know that? Well, I, I asked for authority from her and him to pray for him with authority and proxy. And when I prayed, the voices stopped and he went like this and he sat up and, and it had been going on for weeks. He says, the voice has stopped. And so why did the voices stop? Well, here's the deal. He uh, was going to school and his teacher for mathematics, um, who was trying to be cool with the kids, just also happened to be a hardcore devil worshiper. And he brought in a stack of CDs, which back in the day at this time period, they were about 8 to $10 a piece. Um, we're going back almost 20 years. Some of you may remember when CDs were the big thing. And offered them to any of the kids that want. And they were of a, I don't want to say the band because I don't want to get sued, but it was a Swedish rock band that did not hide the fact that they worshipped uh, the devil and Lucifer. And their music was summoning music, which was satanic ritual music. There are certain records and things that are made just to summon unholy spirits. But he listened to it a couple times, that uh, CD, at home in his room, and that's when the music started, and it would not shut off. It was stuck. It was driving him crazy. And um, I do believe the child would have committed suicide if, if his mother hadn't brought him to me or he'd have been locked up and straightjacketed and put into comfortable rooms. Schizophrenia is very serious. So you get the delusions. You get the hallucinations. You also... Um, get paranoia. Paranoia isn't, it's not something that has to be there. But it is something, there is a fear factor that comes with schizophrenia. And part of the reason why is because the actual ailment is rooted in something that's happened, something that has caused fear to the psyche. So you will have delusions, you'll have hallucinations, you'll have a bit of paranoia, okay? Schizophrenics, there are three ways that I know of that schizophrenia is created. We'll do the first and the most obvious, which is demonic schizophrenia. You see, if somebody has had a physical accident or used too much LSD or mind controlling, you know, ecstasy or some other uh, mind altering drug or even prescription, some psychotropics will do this. If they haven't had either one of those problems, there is a schizophrenia that is caused by demons or unholy fallen angels. The boy who I gave you an example of, uh, he listened to music that had been specifically dedicated to Lucifer and the devil, and it said right on it that it was, and that it was music for those services. Well, unfortunately, the boy, or fortunately, the boy came from a Christian family. Parents didn't know anything about this teacher. Matter of fact, a lot of parents didn't know. I went to the school over this and confronted him in front of the other, the, you know, the, the rest of the school, uh, fac, or not faculty, but the, the head account, the counselor's dean, the principal, his assistant, that teacher, and this mother, and I went, that boy, I want to confront him and find out exactly why he felt like he was able to be giving out satanic items <clears throat> to children. Well, there was there was about a half a dozen, four teachers that were positively, openly into witchcraft and the occult. 
and they were trying to um, get as many children into the occult as possible. So there's demonic, which means <clears throat> demons can get authority to enter into a person. Okay? And when they do, they can bring in all kinds of problems where you will hear voices. Uh, you may smell things, which is a, a, a form of hallucination. But, you know, I had a, a person I was called to go to Plano. Um, they went to their Catholic priest who called the diocese in Chicago. And Father Bob, I had led him to salvation. And he would refer people to me from Chicago and all around to work with whenever he had a spiritual problem. And so they were a very good Catholic couple. Uh, they weren't saved. I led the wife to salvation while I was there. The husband refused to stay. But while I was there, the spirit manifested the thing that she claimed had been happening. Now, her symptoms were this. She would smell a beautiful bouquet of flowers. Okay. Her husband never smelled anything. I smelled it. It was there. It was, it was overpoweringly there. Something would sit down on the bed, and then it would come under the covers and begin to molest her. It was an incubus. Well, I prayed and asked the Lord to bind it, strip it of its rank and authority. She gave me permission, and I asked the Lord to reveal why it was there. She had went to see a tarot reader um, and tea leaf reader at the fair that comes to Sandwich, Illinois. And after that, the demon came home with her. Because if you go into occult practices, whether it be a Ouija board, um, tarot cards, tea leaves, astrology, not astronomy, astrology. Astrology is the worship of the spirits or what we call the principalities that rule over um, large groups of angels. But if you dabble with the occult, you will get the occult. I've known many people have become heavily demonized through Dungeons and Dragons. I used to play it when I was in the military. I played it for years. And while that, before I was a Christian, and I've seen people, I didn't know at the time what was happening to them, but I, I had a friend who became completely demonized. He shut himself in his room. He quit playing. He quit talking with anybody. He became obsessed with the UK. I've seen people lose their mind over that, think they're an actual character in the game. The demonization is real. Uh, this video is getting long. So let me talk about the second. The second is through an accident. At the base of the neck, here you have the top of the spinal cord, the central fissure point, and then you have seven vertebra of the neck. Now, if one of those vertebra becomes off-kiltered, um, in, in other words, they're stacked like this, if one becomes dislodged or or a, a disc can slip out of the neck and it, it can cause the vertebrae to become misaligned. And what happens is at the center fulgus point, the energy that comes up out of the spinal cord goes around what's called the sixth layer of the mind. It's the oasis. It's a circular ball. And it sits just above in the brain, above the central fissure point here. Okay? That energy coming out goes around that ball and then is distributed to the right and left hemisphere. Now you have all six aspects of the sensory because intuitiveness is part of the sensory organs. Okay, it comes out of the what's called the pineal gland, and your intuitiveness, your awareness, uh, which is part of your survival um, nervous system, is one of them. And so what happens is all the hearing that, that you take in, all the things you see, all the things olfactory that you smell on the back of the tongue all your nerve sensations, and your intuitiveness. The energy that comes around that, it processes all this incoming trillions and trillions of data bits. I mean, just looking at this screen, all of these different colors, each one's a different bit of information. And just by moving like that, I've created new pictures. So you see the brain is taking in trillions and trillions of perception points of stimulation and data. And what happens is it, it brings it around and allocates it. It then processes like the Fallon tubes, what you take into this eye, it crosses over and it's changed from visual to, to basically a pressure, a hydro pressure system for sensory, um, hydro pressure system from the ears, the auditory. The olfactory works 
in a different way. It actually breaks down the chemical analysis within the back of the, not the actual nasal passage itself, but when it comes down here and hits, you have several thousand sensory uh, points or glands that are dealing several thousand points that process to these glands and such and give you the ability for taste and smell. Well, what happens is if that vertebrae gets misaligned and it tilts or it moves in any way, you know, that it's called the axiom. If it moves in any way, it creates a misalignment at the base where the effulgence, effulgence means where the energy comes out of the spinal cord because you have two sets of energy producers. The heart produces an electromagnetic field. It goes out one and a half times your arm length. This is part of the intuitive aspect of sensory organs, by the way. Your spinal cord from the base it, and with the peripheral nervous system of the gastrointestinal creates a physiobiological nerve. In other words, a chemically induced energy, L frequencies, your spirit or your life force. That comes up the spinal cord and comes out the central fissure point, and it puts that energy around the brain. Call it your life. So if that energy gets misdirected in any way, then part of the brain, the brain that processes, the way the brain processes, it's like something that's off balance. It will process it incorrectly. Okay. So damage to the brain, damage to the spinal cord can create like a bruising on the brain, a misalignment of the, the vertebra. There was a clinic in Chicago, I don't know if it's still there, that dealt specifically with the axle axioms. And that's the way the vertebrae would go up into the brain. And I remember now, this is going all the way back to the late 80s, because um, I had broke my neck from a fall. My head was stuck over here and my vertebrae were misaligned. It was giving me a lot of problems. And um, so that's how I learned about it. And I learned while I was there that that energy that comes up and into the brain, he he was he worked specifically on that clinic that it's correcting imbalances within the cervical aspects of the, the seven vertebrae of the neck for realigning them. And he pointed out if those top three vertebrae, any of them are out of alignment, it'll cause problems with the way the perceptions of the brain are processed or the processing of the information. Okay? So it'd be like having a, picture it like this, having a, a wall chart with a bunch of holes all next to it or honeycombs. And each one has a way of processing or identifying and determining what should be done with that information identifying and then determining it. And say you have a pin board like on a computer that you've got to push it straight in or on a car, you know, like a fuse. But say you pick that board out and you move it over just a quarter inch and then push it back in. Well, the nerves that are supposed to be processing it are now processing the wrong type. In other words, the wrong stimulation is being sent to them. And they will misalign and improperly process it. Okay. The third type, so we have demonic, we have through damage to the, you know, brain, like a bruise to the brain, um, you know, having a nail go into the head, a spike. I mean, I've seen some pretty bad stuff through research. Lesioning, they don't do that anymore, I hope. The third type is through chemicals. They have found that if people do large amounts of LSD or hallucinogenics over a long period of time and even like ecstasy methamphetamine causes schizoid delusional tendencies and, and occurrences um, even too much magic mushrooms peyote natural things can do this you're not supposed to you see the arsenic and and the toxins in it destroy nerve endings and it's what causes the hallucinogenic reactions so the biological if you're biological processing, if you do too many drugs, and this can be psychotropics too, it can cause a physiobiological form of schizophrenia. 
okay? Because the brain becomes conditioned through the constant influx, and after a while, it no longer is able to determine reality from fiction, and they become muddled. And the person begins living in a semi-pseudo-fashional real world. Pseudo-real world means not real. It'll have mixtures of truth and error. Okay? So, I mean, you look at John Nash. He overcame his schizophrenia. He never got healed of it, but he wrote some incredible works. He was a savant, but he thought he was living with his roommate for two months or two years. And it wasn't until he had a final meltdown that they confronted him and they brought him back to reality. He had no roommate, but he thought he did. And he would converse with them often. Now, when somebody creates a helper like that, that's called an eternal helper, the brain will create someone that can help them through their inability to properly process stimuli or data. The brain does this as a mode of self-preservation because the brain knows if it's unable to process the information correctly, the person will die by walking in front of a car, stepping off a cliff, falling out of a window, eating something toxic. So many times the brain, in a, in a reasonable way, will create a helper to help that person while they're through it. Okay? So you've got three ways that I know of that schizophrenia can occur. Okay? So when we get into schizophrenia, um, one of the things you're going to be looking for is are they able to keep a train of thought? Are they able to keep on the same sentence structure, on the same topic structure? See, a lot of times a schizophrenic will talk about something and then automatically flip to another conversation. Keeping them nailed down on a topic, which you don't have to do with a normal person, is hard with schizophrenia. Because their brain is moving so quickly that they can't stay on a single topic. It's almost as if the brain is in a histrionic state, but not for drama, but for survival. Well, I guess there is a fourth way um, that I found, I didn't want to discuss it, that I found people have schizophrenia, and that's if they've been too abused, T-O-O, -O, too abused and traumatized. I've had a couple people, I, I, I uh, was able to help one, but they're very fragile because they've been so overly physically abused and sexually and mentally abused, usually through their primary caregiver, that they have developed schizophrenia. And that's because their brain refuses to face the truth in the topic and has snapped. Okay, the mind has snapped. And now they are all over the place. Oh, hey, Randy. Good morning. So one of the things you'll know is, is they're unable to, to stay on topic. And that's a, a key sign of schizophrenia is the person will jump around. They'll be either withdrawn. There's usually no middle ground. They're either really withdrawn, they don't want to talk, they just stare at you or they look down, or they're overly talkative. They'll have disorganized behavior. Now, disorganized behavior is just the opposite of organized behavior. In other words, you know what you're going to do. You set a plan. You stick to it. Schizophrenics aren't like that. Uh, they're like a, a frog on a hot plate. It just keeps jumping. So they'll have disorganized behavior. They will get up and look through a drawer and keep moving the things and trying to find something which may not be there. <clears throat> it might even be like, like they might be wearing their glasses, but they're looking for the glasses. Because in their mind, they don't have their glasses. Okay? It can be something that simple. So their behavior will become disorganized. And that's something you can clearly see. They'll have disorganized speech. Now, what do I mean? It's like I was talking about. They will jumble together different stories. They won't be able to stay on one topic. You won't be able to nail them down. And they will just go from this to that to this to that. And it's almost like they trail off continuously. You know, they get to the bottom and, and they'll say, wow, these are cornflakes. Well, you know, I really love the way they make boxes. Do you know that that... Trees are being cut down to produce paper. Do you know so-and-so has a box? And I told her that she shouldn't have that box. 
that it's causing them to do you see what and that's a bad illustration but i'm not good at this they will have disorganized thinking they will not be able to nail their thoughts down imagine being in a head where you have five or six things or even two or three things going on all the time and they demand your attention for instance hearing white noise in one ear or hearing a radio frequency, or hearing a refrigerator make a weird sound, and you just can't stand it. People will take that refrigerator apart, or they'll demolish it, beat it to pieces with a hammer, to try to get that sound, that noise to stop. How about, this is, I had a guy who told me that he, that he had drywall all through his, his sinuses, that he had breathed it in on a job site, and because there was drywall dust on the floor. And and he had been to doctor to doctor. They had even took and cut and peeled his face up and hosed through his sinus cavities. They were as clean as a whistle. He didn't have drywall dust. He had demonic schizophrenia. When I found the root of the cause, um, he had been severely molested and raped by the Catholic priests, uh, not more than one where he lived. He was very devout Catholic. So we were able to get rid of that feeling because he was going nuts. I mean, he was he was losing it. So I've, I've had people that thought they had bugs in them and they couldn't get the bugs out. You know, that's, that was demonic schizophrenia. And the reason why that person thought they had the bugs in them is because they had been horribly abused and somebody had made them ingest bugs and pushed bugs in them. They did it to torture the person. Well, the problem is, is the brain was too traumatized and it couldn't get rid of that. So what did I do? I led, led them in prayer and asked the Lord to reach in and let them see his hand go in and take that bug and crush it and pull it and all its eggs to burn it with holy fire, burn all of its eggs out of there. And then I asked the Lord, have you gotten them all? The person says, no, no, there's... There's another one. It keeps making thousands more eggs. So I said, Lord, burn all the tissue and the eggs. Annihilate it so there's nothing that can regrow. I had to do this several times. And they were very diligent in their mind. Yeah, he's looking, he's looking. Why? Because their mind had to come to grips and had to believe that the Lord was going to destroy those things that had been stuck in them and that they were forced to eat. And the schizophrenia was gone when we were done. It took about four hours working with that lady. So you see there's a fourth way, and it's through traumatization. Um, and people don't understand, but tra traumatization can really, um, it just can throw up a, no a negative wrench in a person's um, ability to, to function and it can destroy their mind all right so some more symptoms catatonic stupor what does that mean it means when somebody's in a catatonic stupor you can lift their arm up and i had a person one time that i was brought in they thought they were faking and they weren't you can push a needle through it there would be absolutely no response why because the brain is completely separated from the body that is the ultimate defense mechanism. Catatonic schizophrenia, it, it's one of the eight types. They say there's five, I, I hold the eight, but is when the body and mind separate. The person pulls into the fantasy realm and decides to live in their head rather than out in their body because they can't take the pain anymore or the abuse or the hatred or the fear that they've been enduring. And um, so you can have that. You can have immobility. Uh, <clears throat> I've worked with people that didn't think they could walk. They, they didn't think they could do this or that. They were limited by their mind. And this is where the power of God really comes in. God can heal anything. He wouldn't be God. He wouldn't be our creator. Our creator can heal anything. He can remove curses from a child. He can remove schizophrenia and anything that bothers a person or that, that takes control of a person. Do you, do you see what I'm saying? 
So schizophrenia will mess a person's life up. It will it'll ruin their ability to think, their cognitive behavior. It'll ruin their emotions. It will suppress many of their emotions, put them into a uh, histrionic, not dramatic state, but fearful state. It'll give them delusions. It'll give them hallucinations. It, it will just destroy their ability to be the person that God wants them to have. Okay? God wants them to be. Um, it can mess with their bodies. It can cause them to become hyperflexible. It can cause them to become uh, in a stupor to where they don't move. They will have excessive motor skills that can sometimes be turned on that are purposeless uh, and that aren't stimulated by anything happening around them. For instance, I had a, a lady that, well, let me give you a guy. I had a guy brought to me. Uh, they drove him all the way from the East Coast to the Midwest and left him with me for a month. And he was like this. And he just couldn't stay. He, I had to keep him on a leash, literally at times. Because he would just go off walking. You know, type of schizophrenia. His was from mind control programming. They had over abused and overused him. But he had the excessive motor activity that wasn't influenced by external stimuli. You couldn't hold him down. He couldn't sit. He couldn't stand to be anywhere. He, here's a weird one that most people don't know about. How about, have you met somebody that is extremely negative, that everything is bad in their eyes? Extreme negativity, um, when it's motiveless, but when somebody has extreme negativity or resistance to instruction or maintenance of, uh, in other words, you can't influence them to do something that might be right for their body. Um, Part of the paranoia or the fear thing is I've had people that, you know, I knew a lady that would not eat out of an open container. Everything had to be brand new. And even on the new ones, she would take secret tape and put it around there. She'd put tape and hide it on the doors to the cabinets because she was, she lived alone, but she was convinced that somebody was coming in and tampering with her food. And in her mind, she believed that. And she was just, she would not. They will starve to death before they'll eat that food because they think you're trying to kill them. Most of the paranoia uh, that they experience is they believe somebody's out to get them. Somebody wants to kill them. And this is why it's all survival mechanisms. It's fight or flight is stuck because something has happened to cause that person's brain to malfunction and believe that they are going to be killed. Okay? Something has happened that's caused that brain to think they are going to be killed. And so they get paranoid because sometimes they have a reason to be paranoid. But the, when it's over, uh, the abuse is over, the brain doesn't know that. It's not able to register it because it's just been too overwhelmed. Okay. Here's a weird one. How about... Uh, Movement or posturing movements, okay? Posturing, for those of you who don't know, is when you try, like if you get two people together, it's embarrassing. When I, I preached my aunt's funeral once, and I had two relatives that were big shots, and, you know, they owned companies with a lot of money they were making. They're, they're very wealthy, at least the ones really wealthy. But they, we just got back from the funeral, and we're eating the bereavement meal, and all they can talk about, well, I just bought myself 15 new custom elongated vans. I'm going to give my workers some good vans right off the old. I just bought 20. They were posturing. Each one wanted to be seen as the bigger man by the family. I, I've never gotten that. I've never gotten where somebody has to posture. Well, posturing um, in schizophrenia could be them just staring at you. They're wanting you to know that, that they're not afraid of you because they think you're wanting to scare them or kill them or grimacing. You know, that's the scary. I call that the demonic grin. Um, we had two wards at Joliet, the K and the L ward, because it was a pod system. And in those was the sexual predators. These guys could not be released. They were very, many of them, heavily schizophrenic. 
And um, matter of fact, I would not go into the, they wouldn't let people go into the K ward. I went up to the door the first time I was there. And because um, you can speak through the, the, the bars and then they're all in their, they have a middle room and they have their rooms. And I started to preach a sermon on the blood of Christ. They went nuts. Um, a lot of them were running back to the rooms. If you could see the stairs, if they could have got to me, they would have killed me. That was demonic schizophrenia, like I had never seen before in my life. There was one that was just like that. I call it the demonic grin. I came home and told my wife, I said, you're not going to believe you could feel the way this guy was staring at me. It's called the demonic grin. I believe when you see posturing through facial or movements, exaggerated movements, I believe that's a part of demonic schizophrenia, okay? So we've got uh, the, the DSM talks about five types of schizophrenia primarily, and you can go into the DSM. I don't want to have to just drag you th through that again. Um, so you can have the extreme negativism, negativism. Uh, I don't know. I, I had a stroke when I went to the hospital, so I don't know if my slurring is, my speech is slurred. And for instance, another aspect of extreme negativism, negativism is this. Have you ever seen one that won't take food? You know, like the lady with the clothes things. Well, you can find a lot of people with severe schizophrenia are homeless because they simply cannot bear to be in one place. They are always on the move, and they're always afraid of people. Their mind has been taken from them. Their security has been taken from them. It's a very, very bad uh, thing. And, um, you know, they just can't help themselves. So when you're dealing with somebody with schizophrenia, um, you have to take all this into consideration. You can't, I see a lot of people that, I, I hate to say this, um, are just unkind. And as a result, you know, and they're Christians. And as a Christian, we're supposed to be the ones that exemplify the Lord Jesus Christ. Um, we're supposed to be the ones that show him with compassion and love to a, a world that's gone astray and um and that's not happening with a lot of people most of the time somebody that's schizophrenic people just don't want to be around i mean it has to be a very close family member like a mother or a father and sometimes a sibling um that will get involved now here's so we i don't know if did i fully describe uh Oh, catanesis, I fully described. Um, the next type is called the the echolia and echopraxia. Uh, of course, echo means like if you say a word in a tunnel and it keeps saying it. Echopraxia and echolia are two things that are called in, in schizophrenia. It's an involuntary repetition or imitation of the observed movements of another. I saw a schizophrenic once because I, I used to go into the mental facility and and work with people when I was allowed to. And there was a man who would parrot a parrot. He thought he was a parrot and he would act like a parrot and he would hold his head up and he would say, you know, Molly wants a cracker. And, and that's, that's a symptom of, of a type of schizophrenia where somebody mocks or copies an animal, an object, or a thing. Okay, and um, Echo Layla, Layla is, in other words, you don't have to ask them for it. You can't stop them from doing it. It's re a repetition of utterances made by other people and or animals. I've seen people that act completely like an animal, like I saw the Monkey King of China. This is going back 30 plus years, back when I was heavy in the martial arts with my Kung Fu instructor. And uh, we were looking at a bunch of martial artists, and there was a guy just squatted down like this, and, and his hands 
down like this, and he was all the way down on the ground with his butt and his knees bent. And I, I said, what's wrong with that guy? And he says, that's the monkey king. He looked like a monkey. He did not look like a human. He sat there. Okay? I had a guy that I went and visited um, who sat in the corner like this with his crackers. He had been through a Vietnamese prison camp. He had never gotten his mind back. And he would sit there like this, and, and he acted like he was an animal, like he was a monkey. And he protected whatever you gave him. You couldn't get it away from him. So uh, when we get to this, um, the difference between exopraxia and, and um, exolalia is exopraxia is involuntary. In other words, they'll copy your physical uh, movements. Okay. Exolalia is where they voluntarily copy the sounds. So they go together um, because if you're going to act like a monkey, you got to make monkey sounds. If you're going to act like a parrot, and literally the guy would stand there with his hands like this, and and he wanted crackers, and he wanted that attention. He identified as a parrot, and uh, that's incredibly sad to say, but it's, it's just I have a hard time teaching on this because I've got so many memories that come to uh, come to come to mind. Um, it's just very upsetting. And anybody that deals with it knows what I'm talking about. So let's go ahead and, and, um, and get into this a little bit more. So what do you do if somebody has schizophrenia? How do you, how do you treat somebody that has schizophrenia that you love? Well, the first thing that I do is I pray for them. I ask the family for permission to pray for him or her in authority with proxy. Oh, good morning, Richard. I ask them if they're cognitive and any bit, a bit able to communicate, if they will give me permission. For instance, I had a guy who I actually became friends with. Um, his name was Tim. He was he was like six foot four, six foot seven, and two hundred eighty pounds. He had massive. He was a huge man. They brought him in all chained up and chained him. These desks will not move. Chained him to that, and they would not leave the room. They had four guys in there. I'm like, what is your problem? <laughs> you know? I said, you can leave. And they said, no. No, you do have, they have no idea who you're dealing with. And I guess he was extremely violent, and he was insanely strong. I mean, insanely strong to where he would – pick people with one arm, and then throw them across the room into the walls. How would you like to be in a pod system where this guy might get out? They might let him out. You don't want to, If they let him out, nobody would go out. He was that dangerous. So they chain him there, and he keeps going like this. He keeps just looking off to the side. And I say, you know, hi, Tim. This is I'm Dr. Tom. I'm the chaplain here. I, I, I want to meet you. I, I want to pray for you. And he's just staring me down like he thinks I want to hurt him. I have no desire to hurt him. I said, can I have permission to pray for you in proxy? He goes. I said, are you hearing voices right now, Tim? He's just staring at me. He's one of those that won't talk. I could tell he was because he keeps looking and there's nothing there where he's looking. He just keeps looking. And so I prayed and I said, Heavenly Father, would you bind Everything in this room, I claim the authority for Tim. I pray and ask that you would bind everything within him, everything around him. Take control of the autonomic structure of his mind, body, soul, and spirit. Everything that he is. And then he stopped. And he, he sits up like this. And he's looking at me with a normal face. Whereas before, I, I, I figured the guy would kill me if he could get loose. And he's looking at me. I said, did the voices stop? He goes, yeah, they did. He got set free. It took about 20 minutes. Next time I went to visit, next week, he wasn't in chains. He was one of the nicest guys you could meet. He was sitting out there. People were still scared of him. But I even took his dog. Um, he had a one of, those, one of those Japanese chow chow dogs. And they, it was in a pound. I went and picked it up. We took care of it until he got out. It took him four months to get out of the county. 
But God cured him of his schizophrenic. His was obvious, obviously demonic schizophrenic. Okay? Well, I've worked with people that have had traumatized schizophrenia. What do I do with that? When it's traumatic, I wrote a five, I, I don't know if I finished it, but it was five books I did write on praying through the Psalms. I wrote them specifically for people with schizophrenia. When I would deal with people that had traumatic or traumatized induced schizophrenia, I would take them and teach them. I would. You have to hand feed them and go through it. They won't do it on their own. They just won't do it on their own. And line by line, I would read it, and I would say, you know, like, blessed is the man. I would say, pray this, true God and Father. True God and Father, blessed is the man, blessed is the man, that walketh not, that walketh not in the way of the sinner, sitteth not in the seat of the scornful. I would lead them through those prayers. I would lead them through prayers to remove all curses, specifically spoken curses. I would lead them in prayers of forgiveness. Don't start with names. Always, Father, forgive all of those who have hurt me or come against me. Forgive me for the thoughts that I've had. Not until they start getting broke loose do you bring names into the conversation or you will re-traumatize them. You will make them worse. It took me about four to five months of working with a, a person who was in their 30s. I didn't want to hear the abuse she had been through. Um, it was that bad. It. Uh, see, that's why I don't like talking about schizophrenia. There's a reason why they have schizophrenia. Okay? But I've seen it reversed. I saw that person become normal. They began taking trips, going to visit family members that had moved out of, not only out of the state, but across the country to get away with, from them. God will completely turn their life around. But you have to take the time to pray with them. Lead them in prayers. Lead them in the prayer of salvation. Lead them in the prayer to forgive others. Lead them in the prayer to forgive themselves. I've seen people that have lost their mind because of a friend dying, or you know, those a lot of soldiers have schizoid delusions, schizoid tendencies, uh, PTSD, but some develop schizophrenia or schizophrenic um, traits because of what's happened in war. You wouldn't believe. If somebody's partner blows up and it splatters over them, it can cause them to lose their mind and, they, and develop schizophrenia to where they're haunted by that person or they hear the screams. I have, I had a person that murdered a lot of people and they were, they couldn't sleep. They were driving themselves crazy because they kept hearing the screams. <clears throat> now they weren't the personal one over the hurting of the other people. It was their parent. But as a child, they had to go through it and be a part of it. And it gave the kids schizophrenia. Father and mother were psychopaths. Um, that's why schizophrenia tends to run in family lines. I don't believe it's genetic. I believe it's demonic. <clears throat> and I believe it's curses from sins. So what do I do? I pray for them. I teach them to pray. I lead them in prayers because only God can correct schizophrenia. Now, if it's a misalignment in their neck or their axiom is off, they can correct that now. And you'd be surprised how when somebody gets those vertebrae back in, how perceptions change within the brain. Um, I did not know it would take this long. I'm going to have to redo the number seven video, too, on, on bipolarism, bipolarity. I don't know what happened to it, but it disappeared. Uh, hopefully this one will stay on long enough. So I lead them in prayers, and I lead them in Bible studies, and then I teach them how to live. I literally take and make a list out of every half an hour what they are to do, and I make them Write out that list, put several copies all around it. I make them, after several weeks, I make them begin getting involved with other people. Because teaching them how to interact with other people, that's going to be the hardest part. 
Because you, you can lead the brain and the person in prayers. But only God the Father can take away whatever fear it was that caused this person to become like this. Whatever happened to cause them. And sometimes it's in vitro. I've seen mentally ill schizophrenics who were young when they developed it in their teens. It's because their mother, I believe, was so horribly abused while they were in the womb. Sin has a drastic and long-term effect upon people's mental health. Um, I, I apologize again for those lost videos. I, I wish to God I knew how. I had three years worth of sermons that I did online. They all disappeared too. So I, I don't have backups. Only I trust YouTube to keep them in the cloud, and I guess they don't. So this is Dr. Tom. If I didn't cover the topic that you would like, uh, please forgive me. Write me a note, and I will do it. Um, I think I'm going to have to do a second one on schizophrenia where I just talk about the eight types of schizophrenia uh, because nobody wants to listen to an hour or two-hour lecture. All right, forgive me for the length. And I'm going to try to get my mind cleaned up and, and do more. I, I'm just having so many memories right now because schizophrenia breaks my heart, unbelievably so. And it should yours too. All right, Lord bless you in Christ's love, Dr. Tom.